Good to see everybody. Um, it is a glorious day. I don't know how about you, but just walking outside today. My God, what a day, what a day. Um, the sun is just shining brightly and it's not too hot and it's it's a little summery and a little autumny all at the same time. Doesn't, doesn't get any better than that. So it's really good to see all of you here at Little Presbyterian Theological Seminary for the Pressler Annual Pressler Lecture. Um, for all of our friends and colleagues who are online, we welcome you as well to all of us together. Uh, we are community. Hey, Tyler, come on in. Um, I'm going to take a moment of executive privilege and introduce many of you who do not know um, my beloved Jessica. I know she's going to say, why did you point me out? But I just want to be sure everybody knows who, who she is. So um, I don't get to do that often enough. Now, our, we, are, we are welcoming our guest uh, lecturer today, Dr. Kimberly B. Hill, who just wears spectacular colors. And to all of you who are here to hear what she is going to tell us about in the spirit of mission, in the spirit of particularly what goes on in our own backyard, which we so often overlook in powerful ways, the witness that has taken place um, at Grace Hope in particular. We are just so very glad to see all of you. The last thing I want to say is, no, two, two last things. Um, can you do two last things? Well, I'm going to do them anyway. So, okay, the next to last thing is for all the members of the President's Roundtable um, who are, are coming uh, this evening and who will be here for the next two days, as well as for those of our President's Roundtable who are going to be online with us for the next two days, we especially welcome you. For those of you who don't know about PRT, it's kind of a group of folk who are close to the Office of the President, and they always are ready to give us advice and counsel um, and often know more than we do. So that's it's a good group to have around us. We also, um, I also want to simply say um, how, how, how to say it, uh, Dean Muffet, it just feels strange not to have Dr. Cliff Kirkpatrick here doing this this year, because this is, this is so much his baby. This is so much the spirit of who he uh, was and continues to be in our midst. And so if you don't know Dr. Kirkpatrick, uh, our now retired emeritus professor of world Christianity and global um, uh, missions, you have missed a treat. Having said all that, welcome to LPTS and welcome to the press election. Oh, I'm supposed to pray. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> you are. Oh, who am I? <laughs> I'm, I'm so you there by no way. I don't even think about you. Um, you got me on that one. <laughs> my, name, my name is Alton B. Pollard III, and um, I am my mother's child and my father's too. All in all seriousness, I am the president of Louisville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. Thank you. Thank you. It is good. <laughs> to be at LPTS. All right, let us pray. For the presence of the living God in our midst, for the power of the spirit that you have imbued us with. Oh God, for the message that we are going to receive through the research and scholarship of Dr. Hill about a church that sits on a hill here in our city of Louisville in the West End and for its ministry and for its leadership and for all of us who are striving to bear witness on this day, we give you thanks for you are God and we are yours. Hear us, O oh God, we pray. Amen. Good afternoon. Yeah. So my name is Deborah Mumford. I'm the uh, academic dean here at Global Presbyterian Theological Seminary. It's really good. Um, so, I, um, so my it is my pleasure 
uh, to introduce our speaker for this personal lecture, Dr. the Reverend Dr. Kimberly Hill, introduce her as the 2022 Pressler Lecturer. And uh, the Henry H. and Marion A. Pressler Lectureship was established to honor a couple's missionary service and to inspire the Louisville Seminary community and its wider community about issues of global mission and the role of American denominations in their historical and present witness to mission. Dr. Kimberly Hill is the Associate Professor of U.S. and African American History at the University of Texas at Dallas. She earned her PhD in U.S. History with a Religious Studies focus and an MA uh, in U.S. History from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She earned a BA from the University of Texas at Austin. Dr. Hill studies the intersection between African-American Protestant missions work and racial justice activism in the Jim Crow era. Her current work focuses on Southern Presbyterian mission, missionaries, the YWCA, the YMCA organizers, and the historically black colleges and universities, and universities affiliated with these leaders. In her book, A Higher Mission, I have a copy of that over here. Um, um, so in, in her book, A Higher Mission, uh, Dr. Hill critically analyzes the colonial history of Central Africa through the perspective of two African-American missionaries, Alonzo Edmiston and uh, uh, Althea Brown Edmiston, who met and fell in love while working as part of the American Presbyterian Congo Mission, an operation which aimed to support the people of the Congo Free State suffering forced labor and brutal abuses under the Belgian colonial governance. The title of Dr. Hill's lecture this evening is The Local Legacies of the Great Commission. In this lecture, Dr. Hill will bring the global mission theme close to home by focusing on the history of the Grace Hope Presbyterian Church right here in Louisville, pastored by our own uh, Reverend Dr. Angela Johnson. So let us, let us welcome Dr. Kimberly Hill. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you very much to LPTS for, for inviting me. I have been visiting Louisville since 2010, first as an advanced placement uh, exam reader, and then in order to learn more about, about my research, I was very pleasantly surprised to, to find out that the missionaries I studied had a church here here in town and then to to get a chance to tour that church and to learn about Smoketown from from the pastor who now runs Grace Hope it yeah it really felt like a surprise and a blessing uh, a sign that that I was on the right path so thank you Reverend Angela thank thank you uh, to the beautiful community of LPTS. Today, we're discussing two missions. Both were Presbyterian and founded in the 1890s to serve people of color. Both were staffed by ministers who came from other communities and dedicated the rest of their lives to the work. Both missions also changed in such dramatic ways over the course of the 20th century that they called into question conventional definitions of what mission work means. How does a mission speak to the practical circumstances of the people it is intended to reach? What distinguishes a mission from the other ministries and the broader society around it? And who or what determines when missions succeed? Is the finish line determined by those who give Christian ministry? Or does success depend on the perspectives of those who are receiving mission support? The two missions we're discussing today are the Presbyterian Community Center of Louisville, formerly known as the Presbyterian Colored Missions, and the American Presbyterian Congo Mission. 
The latter began in 1891 within what was then a remote region of Central Africa. Its two co-founders were the Reverend William Henry Shepherd, who's pictured here, oh, not, sorry, not yet. <laughs> pictured here in the white pit helmet and the white suit on the end. And the Reverend Samuel Lapsley, they established the Luebo Mission Station, which eventually hosted one of the most populous Southern Presbyterian churches in the denomination. Uh, the shed that you're looking at with the thatched roof, that was the original version of, of their church in, in the Weibo Congo. The more recent photo of the John Little Mission Building represents two settlement homes established by LPTS students between 1898 and 1899. The Reverend John Little supervised the Hope Mission and Grace Mission homes as outreach to African Americans living in the Uptown and Smoketown neighborhoods. The two missions became famous as model ministries for people of color, and the congregation once hosted at the Great Mission, Grace Mission Chapel became Grace Hope Presbyterian Church in 1964. Next slide, please. Thank you. The, the American Presbyterian Congo Mission and the Presbyterian Settlement Homes inspired me to rethink definitions of mission work, partly because of the exceptional careers of the two missionaries who worked in both locations. During their 15 years of joint ministry in the Congo Free State, William Henry Shepherd and Lucy Gant Shepherd challenged some of the dichotomies I tend to associate with foreign missions. He did not measure his success in terms of numbers of converts. And she did not interpret her ministry roles as tasks that ended when she left the mission field. While seeking to ch change the lives of African villagers, the shepherds also emphasized how their own lives changed as professional leaders. William, born in, in Virginia in 1865, the year that the Civil War ended, became a prominent explorer, art collector, pastor, and spokesman for human rights. Lucy, born in Alabama in 1867, had to miss school during most of her childhood to help her family share crop cotton. Yet she transformed into a foster home director, a choir leader, a translator, and a women's club activist. Serving abroad made these new roles possible for the shepherds, and they maintained some of those leadership roles after returning to the United States. Their mission work revolved around imagination and faith that Africans and African Americans could find the means to thrive together. Despite the context of European colonialism and American Jim Crow segregation, the shepherds envisioned creating a sphere of influence and safety. They brought that vision to Louisville in 1912 when William H. Shepherd became the pastor of what is now Grace Hope Presbyterian Church. Next slide, please. This photograph of Shepard with his friend, Prince Maxamalinge, represents another of his unique contributions as a missionary. In 1892, Shepard became the first Westerner welcomed into the royal court of the Kuba Kingdom, that's K-U-B-A, in central Congo. It was a large and reclusive African society that had resisted influence from Congo Free State officials or any other visitors. The king, who had the title of Niini Kota Nguke, made an exception for Shepherd by announcing that he was, in fact, the spirit of a princely Kuba ancestor. Historians and anthropologists interpret this choice as less of a literal belief, more of a diplomatic precaution to help the king prepare for a forthcoming stream of unauthorized colonial incursions. Still, it's notable how William Shepherd continued to embrace his connection to the Kuba kingdom through most of his life. He learned the Bouchon language of the Kuba people fluently. He accepted his local nicknames, Shepete and Bondere Indon. And he requested permission to build a Presbyterian mission station in the Kuba capital city of Mushenge. In the meantime, he established a mission station called Ibok located close to the Kuba kingdom and staffed by African-American missionaries. When a new king took the Kuba throne, Shepard got involved in the political upheaval by sheltering the now ostracized Prince Maxamalinge at the new mission station. 
The shepherds also named their son Maxamaninge in his honor. During furloughs and after leaving Congo, William Shepherd remained focused on his diplomatic alliance enough to publish detailed accounts of his early encounters with the Cuba in Southern Presbyterian Press, in the Hampton Institute Journal, and in his 1917 book, Presbyterian Pioneers in Congo. At one time, Americans viewed William Shepard as one of the two most famous black male celebrities in the world. He shared an academic background with the other famous leader, Booker T. Washington, as well as sharing compelling public speaking skills. Both men graduated from Hampton Institute with training in the industrial and ag agricultural education style that Washington later promoted through Tuskegee Institute. According to the historian Elizabeth Engel, photographs like this one also help to enhance the fame of William Shepard by representing contrast. Standing next to Maxamalinge in his royal feathered hat and his belt embellished with expensive cowrie shells, Shepard looks almost plain, <laughs> except for the brightness of his pith helmets and the brightness of his white suit. This standard Western missionary look from the late 19th century makes a nonverbal argument that Shepard was acting as a standard average missionary. But considering that he was the first African American appointed to that position by the Southern Presbyterian Church, and considering the controversies surrounding Black leadership in this segregated denomination, an implied perception of Shepard as conforming to ministry norms was remarkable for, for his time period. Next slide, please. During the late 1890s up to 1909, the American Presbyterian Congo Mission participated in an international human rights campaign to stop atrocities in the Congo Free State. The choice to understand this campaign as an important part of Presbyterian ministry redefined the missions for the shepherds and their American colleagues. The men featured in this image traveled together from the Congo Mission to Leopoldville with the intent to testify that they had seen people tortured by mercenaries, displaced from their homes, and forced to work at the behest of a rubber company controlled by King Leopold II of Belgium. The Reverend William Morrison, pictured on the left, controlled Presbyterian efforts to publicize evidence of, of these abuses and to seek international support for the campaign. The Reverend Shepherd followed through on Morrison's instructions to tour a region where local Africans are being subjected to forced labor and to photograph the amputations and the terror inflicted on them by mercenaries who work for the rubber agents. Shepard recruited the African witnesses pictured here to stand with him when he was sued by the Belgian government for alleged libel based on the bad publicity. This case and its eventual dismissal hastened the removal of Leopold II as sole ruler of the Congo Free State. It also highlighted, highlighted a dramatic shift in how the Southern Presbyterian denomination addressed evangelism and politics. The denomination was created near the beginning of the American Civil War when it endorsed arguments that the debate over legal slavery was a secular issue irrelevant to the spirituality of church ministries. But the Congo missionaries came to view the domestic slave trade within Central Africa differently because they witnessed how the looming fear of capture and torture drove villagers away from the mission churches. Physical needs for safety and provision needed to be protected before spiritual goals like evangelization could continue unhindered. Shepard's words from a 1907 article described his perspective on how colonial oppression hurt the Cuba kingdom. He said, Looking upon the change scene now, one can only join with them in their groans as they must say, our burdens are greater than we can bear. The fact that black and white American Presbyterians cooperated in the human rights campaign was notable. For Shepard, it also brought initial trepidation. He worried that he would face more criticism and repercussions for his statements than William Morrison would. Shepard pushed back on Morrison's request to detail the atrocities during his speaking tours on the assumption that most Southern Presbyterians would disapprove. 
as he said, being a colored man, I would not be understood criticizing a white government before white people. He was surprised and invigorated when the denomination and the US government sent support before his 1909 libel trial. According to his biographer, William E. Phipps, Shepard recalled his acquittal as a victory for, quote, those in the American government who have fought for justice, those in various Christian denominations who have taken the deepest interest in us possible, and those in the Southern Presbyterian Church, whose holy and high mission has always been to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, and to suffer the distressed. Shepard's interpretation of justice in this quote combined biblical principles of provision with openness to political intervention on behalf of oppressed people. And he found more opportunities to combine Presbyterian ministry with social justice pursuits after relocating to the Grace Mission Home. Next slide, please. The Shepherds retired from the Congo Mission shortly after the 1909 libel trial and moved to Louisville in 1912. Before focusing on their local ministries, let's examine two scenes of how they organized their lives abroad. This first picture shows the residents and parishioners of the Congo Mission Ebonk Station enjoying a leisure day with music. The missionaries in white outfits and hats are seated with African youth from the mission boarding schools and local young men holding an American flag, a drum, French horns, and a tuba. They make up the Ebonk Brass Band, one of several features of this mission station reminiscent of the American South. The picture fascinates me as a representation of the shepherd's goals for this community of African parishioners and African-American missionaries. The introduction of music, hobbies, and traditions from the US was not unusual in itself. These activities helped to define the civilizing missions that tended to accompany imperialism. But the Black Presbyterian missionaries often hosted these cultural activities in formats that were not typical in their home country. Lucy Gant Shepherd translated Negro spirituals into local languages so that African church members could form their own Jubilee Singers Chorus. Mariah Fearing invited local chiefs and relatives to sit on her porch and to teach foster children the traditional stories of nearby villages. At the end of the school week, Althea Brown Edmiston encouraged local boys to write and perform dramatic skits about their tribal histories and, their, and current events. Alonzo Edmiston organized Presbyterian churches in local villages by encouraging members to continue seeking help from their village elders rather than relying only on the Presbyterian evangelists. Beyond these ways of incorporating African culture, the African American missionaries also used photographs like this to show how they had attained li livelihoods and leadership status that were unlikely in their home country. Uh, there's another photo similar to this that I found in my own research that shows just the missionaries who were featured on that side all in white, standing on this field playing cro croquet. And I just think about Mariah Fearing, one of the ladies in the white pith helmets, the fact that she was born on an Alabama plantation in the slavery, continued working on that plantation in through her young adulthood, and that she could end up having a career that involved playing a pretty elite game of croquet on the other side of the world. That image said a lot about how she felt her life had changed. <coughs> Next slide, please. These are examples from the Shepherd's Kuba art collection. This statue of a king and these embellished belts are displayed in the William H. Shepherd Library at his seminary alma mater, Stillman College. Shepherd and other African-American missionaries collected rare art like this out of admiration for regional African cultures. And the major part of his collection is now at Hampton University. 
I argue that the display of this art also signaled what these missionaries wanted to communicate about how life on the African continent influenced them. The historian James Campbell argued that William Shepard's descriptions of Kuba people showed that he considered the beauty and orderliness of their society as a counter argument to stereotypes about black inferiority. Althea Brown Edmiston researched Kuba society in later years to produce the first dictionary and grammar book of their language. And in the process, she also found certain features of this Af African kingdom admirable, especially the fact that Kuba women had voting rights before women in the United States. Mm. Yeah. The process of gathering these observations enhanced the careers of both of these missionaries. William Shepard was inducted into the Royal Geographic Society for his explorations, and Althea Brown Edmiston made a major contribution to the field of linguistics. They continue to be recognized as respected professionals through the rest of their lives. Sharing symbols of their familiarity with African cultures through art and through their children's first names was a way for these African-American missionaries to affiliate themselves with historic accomplishments while drawing attention to their own expertise. Celebrating local art and reaching professional milestones represented success from the perspectives of Shepard and Brown Edmiston. But we should keep in mind how this measure of success did not always coincide with typical understandings of mission work. The American Presbyterian Congo mission focused on outreach to people groups besides the Cuba for most of its history because the number of converts from the Cuba kingdom remained relatively low. The foster homes and the girls' schools managed by Lucy Gant Shepherd and Althea Brown Edmiston held the interest of local children, but without inspiring most Cuba parents to attend the mission church. Without significant numbers of Cuba church members, Congo mission supervisors saw little reason to fund publications in the Cuba language or to support Shepard's long-term goal of opening a mission station in the Cuba capital city. The Shepherds left the Congo mission as its outreach to Cuba people dwindled, and as the Cuba kingdom suffered from increasing colonial taxation and land seizures. Most mission historians agree that the Shepherds' missions to Cuba people failed due to the inability to inspire many conversions. But, as we're going to see through the rest of this presentation, their mission service wasn't over in 1910. Analyzing their continuing work within the U.S. helps us understand why the Shepherds considered attention to arts, culture, and social issues important for successful ministries. Next slide. William and Lucy Gant Shepherd were invited to serve Grace Presbyterian Church in Louisville by the Reverend John Little, who's pictured here on the right-hand side. Little was one of the six LPTS students who started the Grace and Hope Mission Homes in 1898, and the Presbyterian of Louisville appointed him as supervisor of both projects the following year. Little planned on joining the Congo Mission if this position had not been offered to him. Instead, he remained in Louisville until his death in 1948, overseeing the acquisition of new properties and the scheduling of community activities hosted in the mission homes. Little chose an industrial education focus through classes in sewing, cooking, carpentry, and shoe repair. Though these vocational programs attracted some adults, most of the regular attendees at the Presbyterian missions for its first 14 years of operations were children from the East End. To serve the children's health needs, Little also used land near the mission home to provide the first playground and the first public bathhouse in the area. He argued that these amenities were necessary to help local people survive the poverty and inadequate housing conditions that dominated the uptown and smoketown neighborhoods. He founded Grace Church within the Grace Mission Home in hope of drawing more attention to the educational and public health projects. When Charles Allen, the second man pictured here, joined the mission in 1926, he became the pastor of the Hope Mission in Uptown until his death in 1962. Local historian George C. Wright describes the Presbyterian Colored Missions of Louisville as two of the most highly regarded and generously supported settlement homes for African-Americans in the country. 
They became famous as model responses to the Great Migration, a term representing decades of travel by millions of Black individuals and families fleeing the post-Reconstruction South for major cities in Northern and Western states. The Great Migration doubled the African-American population of Louisville from just under 21,000 in 1880 to over 47,000 in 1930. Most of these migrants were rural cotton sharecroppers, seeking their first opportunities to own modern homes, live in thriving communities, and earn wages. The Presbyterian missions offered support for families who experienced challenges after arriving in the city. They found options at Grace and Hope when they needed to train for a different type of job, receive treatment for an illness spreading through the tenement building, or find a safe place for their children to play. John Little's connections with local philanthropists and business owners also enabled him to suggest some of the mission home attendees for positions as school teachers and domestic servants. Next slide, please. I photographed this beautiful mural in 2019 while I was visiting Smoketown with Reverend Angela Johnson. Its message, Smoketown is worthy of everything, alludes to the victories and the crises that this neighborhood has faced through its history. The images of William Shepard and Albert E. Macy represent different perspectives on how leaders hope to serve the neighborhood and Black citizens of Louisville in general. Louisville had several elements that made the city attractive to its growing population. Its location along the Ohio River kept shipping and industry thriving with the potential for steady hiring. <clears throat> Unlike other Southern states, Kentucky did not adopt post-reconstruction grandfather clauses that stripped non-white voters of suffrage. As of 1891, Kentucky also required a relatively short residency period for voter registration. These features helped to attract a range of African-American residents who represented different social classes and various neighborhoods. Though the population of Smoketown included many African-American residents in the late 1890s when the Presbyterian missions began, the neighborhood was not officially segregated at the time. We see a reminder of this in the fact that Grace Hope Presbyterian currently meets in a church building that once housed a German Methodist congregation. Still, political and economic factors combined to lead many working class and impoverished migrants to tenement apartments in Smoketown during the early 20th century. Over time, Black residents remained less likely to relocate elsewhere because city leaders failed to investigate housing discrimination. The tenements became dangerous for lack of renovation and lack of modern plumbing. Diseases spread quickly due to overcrowding as people built temporary shelters and alleyways. The presence of nearby factories didn't translate into sufficient hiring of non-white staff above menial roles and meager pay scales. Smoketown's name, derived from the smoke of the factories, came to symbolize the expected racial makeup of the neighborhood. Despite the lack of official housing segregation in Louisville, statistics indicate that racial enclaves became more concentrated there between 1940 and 1970. City officials mark these enclaves with related policies like the unequal distribution of parks and excessive police surveillance. The Shepherds arrived in Smoketown in 1912, one year before the election of a new mayor who promoted what was called unwritten Jim Crow law, and two years before the city adopted a short-lived residential segregation ordinance. Lucy described their first year in the neighborhood as a trying experience, for I had been accustomed to open spaces and a beautiful country. The noises and unkempt condition of the streets and the poorly lighted and inadequately ventilated rooms were hard to accept. It would be another 30 years before the city provided a large number of modernized public housing units in the neighborhood. In the meantime, the Shepherds helped residents access public health, education, and recreation programs that provided some relief from the crises that were starting to define the neighborhood. William leveraged his fame as the Black Livingston of the Congo Mission <laughs> to draw large crowds and to increase church membership at Grace. 
He helped Grace Mission continue its youth focus by publishing a book and articles designed for young readers. He may have inspired at least two local teenagers to enroll in historically black colleges. Since the church met inside the Grace Mission Home Chapel, his celebrity status publicized the settlement home services to new clients on a weekly basis. Lucy also increased community engagement by starting a popular choir and by volunteering with the children's programs. Grace Church Sunday School Services attracted 970 attendees by 1915, with the potential for more visitors if additional space became available. William Shepard became a local leader who helped bring improvements to Smoketown through individual effort and with white philanthropic support. His contributions boosted the popularity of the Presbyterian Colored Missions in the city and nationwide. But his leadership st style differed from that of our second local leader, Albert E. Macy, in matters of organizational control and immediacy. From the time of his appointment as pastor, Shepard was the only African-American staff member of the Presbyterian Mission Homes until John Little passed away in 1948. The growth of the missions was credited to Little's leadership skills and his teaching style. Shepard deferred to Little's decisions about where Grace Church would meet, even though the Mission Home Chapel needed obvious repairs and was damaged by fire in 1921. The church structures that the Shepherds established in Central Africa, like that first picture that you saw, those were the last freestanding churches that William Shepherd built and controlled before his death. A contrast, Albert E. Macy gained recognition as a local leader because he emphasized independent black leadership and property ownership. While increasing Smoketown residents' access to social services, he also challenged the conditions that made those services necessary. The relatively recent expansion of Jim Crow segregation in Louisville housing and, and in Louisville schools. Macy's career as principal of Booker T. Washington Elementary School and Central High kept him engaged in forthright civil rights activism from the 1910s until his death in 1963. He criticized John Little for using the success of the mission homes to exert influence over the neighborhood schools. School board members heeded Little's advice about hiring teachers rather than consulting with the African-American school administrators. Mazik created an alternative by helping to establish a non-segregated college across the river in Indiana so that Louisville students could defy the 1904 day law that segregated all public education in this area. When Louisville police raided Central High School in search of suspected thieves, Mazik's public condemnations of police brutality led to the establishment of a juvenile court that he served within for four years. The court helped to protect the, the children's interests by taking high school students out of the jurisdiction of local police. Albert Mazik's emphasis on African-American autonomy and institution building left him less likely than William Shepard to receive support from local white donors. But Mazik's priorities reflected the ways other local black leaders worked to preserve the dignity of Smoketown. Though the neighborhood became known for high concentrations of poverty, Black communities of Louisville pooled resources to make valuable services accessible to African Americans. The National Baptist Convention had its missions department headquarters here, where notable activists like Nanny Helen Burroughs helped form new chapters of the National Association of Colored Women. This association advanced civil rights causes while also sponsoring classes for children and young adults, similar to those offered at the Presbyterian Mission Homes. Local educators and business leaders also cooperated to establish the first university, high school, hospital, and library open to Black patrons. Albert Mazie founded that library, and his commitment to providing healthy recreation options was so strong, he took out a mortgage on his own house to secure the needed funds to build a nearby YMCA building in 1892. Local histories depict Louisville's Black communities as thriving with, local, with social activities and large churches and academic options that were unavailable in most other parts of the U.S. South. But according to the historian George C. Wright, many of these initiatives failed by the 1930s 
for lack of funding. The largest source of local donations went to the Presbyterian mission homes because their leader, John Little, enjoyed more recognition among wealthy white Louisville residents. Next slide, please. This group portrait from the 1916 Southern Presbyterian Women's Conference helps to explain why the fame of John Little and the Presbyterian Mission Homes increased and why that fame was historically significant during the 20th century. The, the individuals featured here attended an annual conference designed to teach Bible lessons and domestic skills to African-American women. Stillman College in Tuscaloosa hosted the event and a white denominational leader named Hallie Paxson Winsboro organized it. Winsboro likely chose to feature domestic lessons like sewing and cooking in the conference schedule to conform to what was becoming the prevailing format for educational outreach to black populations. She followed the lead of the Louisville Missions, Hampton Institute and Tuskegee Institute by emphasizing vocational and industrial education. In the following decade, American and European education experts would endorse industrial education as the best way for all people of African descent to learn. Between 1917 and 1925, the Phelps Stokes Commission sponsored three education reports about schools, colleges, and universities serving Black students in the United States and on the African continent. The author of these reports was named Thomas Jesse Jones, and he endorsed a standardized form of industrial education as a race-specific training model. This training would emphasize adaptation and community consciousness based on the premise that coursework needed to address the presumed circumstances of a typical Black community. Though these studies started with observation of many different places and many different people groups, Jones oversimplified the typical Black community in the U.S. or abroad as one facing blight and poverty. He intended industrial education to prepare Black students to perform manual labor for white employers or white landowners who would serve as the students' models of success. The fact that the Presbyterian Colored Missions were already providing industrial education and the Southern Presbyterian women featured here were following suit brought the denomination to what was then the cutting edge of academic theory. In 1908, one of the Shepherd's white colleagues from the Congo mission compared his mission field with that of John Little, and he argued that Little's work in Louisville had more potential for success because he served African-Americans whose family histories of enslavement and domestic servitude had already exposed them to, quote, Civilization. <laughs> he used the term civilization as a metaphor for the respectability people of color were expected, expected to gain by performing manual labor under white supervision. But this quote overlooked an alternative force that was already influencing the Southern Presbyterian denomination. And we look back at this photo, we can see that force at work. In the front row, we can see three Black Presbyterian women who modeled a more intellectual and professional path to respectability. So the lady in the front row who's holding a baby in her lap, that's Lillian Thomas de Yampert. The lady seated just next to her on this side, towards me, that's Ms. Mariah Fearing. The, she's the lady who introduced me to this, this work. And next to, to Miss Mariah Fearing is Lucy Gant Shepherd. These three former Congo missionaries were the only Black women on the conference program who were identified with the titles of Mrs. and Miss. And each woman spoke based on her experiences abroad. These missionaries racially integrated the conference speakers list, and they made the, event, the conference events more collaborative. 
Though neither of these female missionaries received permission to return to Congo after 1916, they continued to wield authority and influence at denominational events as leaders in the Southern Presbyterian Church. Next slide, please. It may have been the influence of these Congo missionaries that led the organizer of that women's conference, Hallie Paxson Winthrow, to engage in civil rights activism during the 1930s. After volunteering with the Commission on Interracial Cooperation, Winsboro became an early member of the Association of Southern Women for the Prevention of Lynching. She worked with an interracial coalition of female leaders from other denominations that included Mary McLeod Bethune and group founder Jesse Daniel Ames. They met at Tuskegee Institute near its statue of Booker T. Washington. But the women's coalition focused on promoting justice and equal protection instead of promoting Washington's industrial education ideas. Their protests against racist mob violence succeeded in reducing lynching rates nationwide for the first time in four decades. And Winsboro's interest in being involved in interracial coalitions such as this started after she started coordinating with Black Presbyterian leaders at Stillman. Next slide, please. <coughs> the previous example suggested how Lucy Shepard's leadership style inspired other Presbyterian women to engage in inter interracial collaboration rather than focusing just on vocational instruction. Her husband's legacy in Louisville is more difficult to summarize partly because of how his name became associated with signs of increasing segregation. We're looking at a relatively recent sign for the renovated Shepherd Square housing complex and an architect's rendering of the new water features at Shepherd Park. Both projects continue to serve Louisville in 2022, and both were created specifically to serve an African-American clientele. As mentioned earlier, the need for additional affordable housing was dire in Smoketown for much of its history. <clears throat> but the relatively quick defeat of the city's 1914 residential segregation ordinance ensured that additional housing did not include official race-based designations during most of the 1910s and 1920s. Likewise, Louisville did not require segregation of public parks before the 1920s. Shepherd Park in the West End became one of the first city parks designed for African Americans only. Its creation in 1925 filled a need for recreation options, but only with the cost of restricting non-white access to most of the existing city parks. Shepherd Square provided over 1,000 public housing units in 1942, just as World War II brought new waves of, of African American migrants to the city. The University of Louisville Oral History Center conducted several interviews with former Shepherd Square residents who expressed gratitude for the community and for its easy access to Grace Mission activities. Some of them remembered Fred Stoner, for example, the staff member who provided boxing lessons to Cassius Clay, better known as Muhammad Ali, at the Presbyterian Community Center. But nostalgia for the old Shepherd Square did not compensate for the fact that Black applicants were not allowed to access the larger public housing projects reserved for white only. Shepherd Square never had enough vacancies to meet the needs of its target population, and underfunding in later decades hastened its renovation into a more expensive mixed-use development. Next slide, please. This picture is from a vintage postcard of the former YMCA building near Smoketown. Albert E. Maisie helped to found this neighborhood branch because black men were not allowed into the existing Louisville Y at the time. The YMCA was one of the black community organizations that William Shepherd supported beyond his duties at the Presbyterian Mission Homes. 
His participation in the YMCA offers insight into lesser known aspects of his leadership style. Though he took on a public persona as the children's friend while pastoring Grace Church, Shepard focused on speaking to college and university students through the African-American branches of the Y. Touring historically black colleges was a strategy he had used in the 1890s to recruit African-American Presbyterian missionaries. And during his first year as, as Grace Church pastor, Shepard traveled to North Carolina for the first black YMCA student conference. He shared the podium with an African student and urged the attendees to consider entering the mission field. The program recognized him as the pioneer missionary to the Congo, and later conferences continued to feature black missionaries and African students. Shepard lent his fame to an organization that celebrated black professionals and elite higher education. The Black YMCA student conferences built on that foundation to later host speakers like Howard Thurman, who criticized European colonialism, promoted civil rights activism, and endorsed Afro-Asian solidarity. Likewise, Lucy Shepard attended when the YWCA, the Young Women's Christian Association, hosted its first Southern Interracial Conference in 1921. She performed the song, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. <laughs> and she helped ease lingering trepidation about whether hosting this desegregated event in Louisville was feasible at the time. The program continued smoothly enough to inspire additional interracial dialogue among Y women. And that dialogue that started in 1921 led to the National YWCA disavowing segregation in 1946. Next slide, please. So with this picture, we're we're seeing how the Shepherd's legacies in Louisville also included a continuing professional connection to Africa. In 1961, a delegation of three ministers from the Presbyterian Church of the newly independent Democratic Republic of the Congo visited the Presbyterian mission homes. They met a colleague of theirs named Benjamin Ngulungu, who was enrolled at LTPS. Or, sorry, LPTS. The individual in the lighter suit brought personal memories of the shepherds and other Black Presbyterian missionaries. His name was Shisungu Daniel. Mariah Fearing had become Shisungu Daniel's foster mother when he was a baby. He grew up visiting the shepherds' e box station, and he became a Presbyterian minister under the guidance of Alonzo and Althea Brown Edmiston, just as the mission churches in Congo were just getting large enough to start their own synod. After Althea passed away in 1937 and Alonzo announced his imminent retirement, Shisungu Daniel assured him that his African friends would give him a warm farewell, quote, in the same way that all the friends of Althea have welcomed her with joy in heaven. Lucy Shepard passed away in 1955, a few years before Shisungu Daniel's arrival, but he still visited the city to honor the memory of her, to honor the memory of William Shepard, and to honor their Congo mission colleagues. The African community that the Shepherds built inspired loyalty that transcended geography and transcended time. Next slide, please. Our time together concludes with thoughts about the present and the future of Grace Hope Church. The Reverend Angela Johnson serves as the current teaching pastor. Her background as a graduate of LPTS and the regular contributions of LPTS interns echo this congregation's roots in the mission outreach of local seminarians. Reverend Johnson also carries on other aspects of Grace Hope history by keeping the church engaged in community service. Following the death of William Shepherd, about 20 years passed before Grace Hope received another long-term pastor. His name was Reverend William Theodore Byrd. 
the second. Smoketown began to change during his tenure. The neighborhood population declined, as did the church membership. In 1967, the Reverend Terrence Davis started his term as the longest serving Grace Hope pastor so far. He remained in the position until 1990. Davis committed to increasing the number of black leaders and staff within the Presbyterian community centers, to promoting local voter registration, and to co-founding the Smoketown Housing Improvement Corp. Sorry, Smoketown Housing Improvement Corporation. These activities combined industrial skills training in the form of renovating houses through the corporation with forthright activism during the civil rights era. Reverend Johnson faces similar circumstances in 2022. The redevelopment and gentrification of parts of Smoketown raises housing prices and it's leading to mass displacement of poor residents whose families were in the neighborhood for decades. She, uh, she accepts and sponsors temporary ideas like this wall of love pictured here as ways for the church building to provide the needy with practical resources like toiletries and clothing. And the church also hosts regular food drives. But Grace Hope also keeps an active justice ministry to confront crises that keep many local people in need. The church has worked with clout, citizens of Louisville organized and united together to secure an affordable housing trust fund and to initiate restorative practice reforms in local juvenile courts. Next slide, please. Our final slide shows some of the ongoing partnerships that Grace Hope members engage in to promote social justice. A pop-up grocery event that took place near the church parking lot distributed fresh food to Smoketown neighbors. But this event served the broader purpose of announcing the church's cooperation with a forthcoming co-op grocery store. Reverend Johnson looks forward to making healthy options available in what is currently a food desert. And the co-op will also serve neighbors by remaining employee owned. She provided the other two photographs of flu shot events on church grounds as reminders that Grace Hope remains involved in addressing the public health needs of its community during this recent ongoing pandemic. By remaining flexible enough to observe and address the shifting priorities of their community, Grace Hope church members are conducting a mission. Their mission involves many activities outside the church doors and even beyond the Smoketown neighborhood with people who may never become church members. It speaks to broad societal issues while remaining specific enough to explore the background of a single individual in the food drive line. It holds potential to influence many lives while relying on the generosity of small numbers of volunteers and part-time staff. Grace Hope remains active without imminent signs of securing many new members or of maintaining control of its surroundings. The fact that Grace Hope continues its outreach anyway convinces me that effective missions involve commitment to a specific place and group. Effective missions also observe and respond to the defining crises of their time. The Shepherds and John Little modeled that type of commitment. They remained invested in their chosen communities and made it possible for later generations of Americans and Africans to contribute to expand both missions further. This shared legacy of the Congo mission and the Presbyterian Colored Missions could have been celebrated in earlier years if supporters and administrators of the Louisville Settlement Homes had not kept an exclusive focus on white educational leadership. How can we support the ongoing mission of Grace Hope Church? We can follow the lead of its former first lady, Lucy Shepard. She served the congregation's programs while staying active with various other communities. She shared her expertise, her time and her resources generously while also seeming comfortable in supporting roles. She noticed problems and found innovative ways to address them. She didn't assume that problems were inevitable. And Lucy Shepard did not let contemporary sentiment, sentiments dictate which races or nationalities she included in her community. 
Her ministry style remains welcoming and ready to defy expectations. Our missions can do likewise. Thank you. Well, I was, this is a, that was a lot of a lot of wonderful information. Uh, so we want to have the chance to engage with Dr. Hill. So we have uh, about 20, 30 minutes for questions. All right. So uh, so if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand for those who are online. Uh, if you can uh, type your question in the chat, uh, we'd like that. Or if you would like to articulate them, then also indicate in the chat or raise your hand and we will try to make sure you're able to do that. So in the meantime, in the room, questions that any of you may have for Dr. Hill. Yeah. I have a very basic question. Um, you may have you, you may have said that Dr. Hill, but I wasn't clear on what the the years of, of ministry at Grace or or at Grace or at, or um, the two pastors means they've been shepherd. The shepherds were at Grace Hope from 1912 until Reverend Shepherd's death in 1927. Lucy Shepherd remained until her death in 1955. Albert Mazik was, was not a minister with, with Grace Hope. I included him because the type of leadership he was doing in the community provided some hints of how, how Smoketown was growing, not necessarily as a direct result of what was happening through the Presbyterian Community Center. Other questions? Who are the Black Nation champions today, like Little or Shepherd, if we have any in the room? In. Mm. I think that would, for speaking to current events in Louisville, I would need to turn that over to to someone with more authority. <laughs> there. Uh, mainly because I I am just in the past few years starting to understand black communities in Louisville myself. So I've been introduced through through Grace Hope Church and through Reverend Angela. So yeah, I I would ask ask her. Um, that is somewhat of an interesting question. Um, what I've seen since I've been eight years at Grace Hope is that people, churches are kind of siloed like, and in an effort to try to bring people together, that's not always easy. Yeah. That's one thing I love about clout. And I'm saying that because these are local churches that come together uh, on one accord to do the work of justice ministry. But as to try to say who, I mean, you have different voices, you know, um, from different organizations. But it would be certainly valuable for churches to come together and work together in particular areas. And I see my brother right there. Adrian Baker, Pastor Baker, he and I are working with one organization on establishing um, um, chronic care given by pastors for our individual church members, but also for people in 40203, mm -hmm. which is one of the poorest zip codes in the United States. So right now there is no break. Many voices, but we do need to come together. May I, yeah. may I echo? Um, so I've been asked this question as well. Where is your king? Where is your um in for so long um the white community has looked for some type of visible leader that looks like what you would want them to look like. 
Uh, we we found with the Breonna Taylor uh, protests and things, and people asking, where are your faith leaders? I said, they're there, but they might have on jeans and Jordans. <laughs> they may have on t-shirts. They may not, they might not have what you're expecting them to look like with as far as respectability. We are still there. We are still one, and we are still fighting. Thank so you. it is many voices, yet we are one. Thank you. And if I can answer your question without focusing on Louisville, uh, theologians and missions historians are more likely to answer that by, by pointing across the Atlantic Ocean now, say, saying that the, the main energy in, in missions is through world, world Christianity and through through the choices, the initiative of Christians from the African continent, from Asia, also from Latin America, where congregations have grown much larger than most in, in Europe and in the United States, and where, where they say uh, you, can, you can find the uh, the most vibrant interpretations of the faith for for the 21st century. Yeah. She 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 answered the question before. I'm wondering whether your uh, research um, delved into the area where the community center was was taken down and the new center was built up and then closed. Do you have those here? I know you can't do everything <laughs> today, but I just wondered if your book or your research has gone into that time. My book does not mention Louisville nearly as much as I as I have today because it focuses on, on Alonzo and Althea Brown Edmiston. Uh, through looking at church history and, and with some information that I've learned from Rick and Angela. Um, I know that the two mission homes were consolidated in the early 1960s. And so the building that would have been used for the Hope Mission Home was sold, I think around 1962. Grace, Grace Church moved into its own building in 1977. Those are the dates that I have for now. Um, I was wondering, uh, I thought it was striking uh, when you were talking about how um, uh, Shepherd uh, was one of the first black missionaries um, in Central Africa for the Presbyterian Church, or specifically the Southern Presbyterian Church. Um, it, it's something I wasn't expecting to hear. I was wondering if you could um, tell us a little bit about um, the Southern Presbyterian Church at that time. What was it about Shepherd that um, uh, he was able to break that ground um, in the Southern Church? And uh, was the Southern Church um, or the Presbyterian Church in general um, different from other denominations at the time in that regard? I'll answer about Reverend Shepherd first. So Reverend Shepherd was born into a very committed Southern Presbyterian family that that made him unique for, for his time because after the Civil War, it was more typical that, that uh, African-American Christians would join a denomination such as African Methodist Episcopal or National Baptist that would have, that would accept black administrators, uh, appoint black bishops. His, his parents wanted to remain in, in a Southern Presbyterian church and that's why he also attended the Southern Presbyterian Seminary for, for African-American men. 
what made what made it possible for him to get appointed to to be a missionary was a lot of persistence. He he started requesting the position at least three years before it was authorized. He was required to wait until until the denomination was able to identify a white seminarian who was willing to to travel abroad with him with the mostly unspoken expectation that that white seminarian would be his supervisor. Mm. But then his his partner, Samuel Lapsley, who passed away yeah. from Blackwater fever during his first year yeah. abroad. And Shepard became the director of, of the Congo Mission for a segregated Southern denomination by default. Mm. And and did what he knew to to make that that mission last. What he knew was was making an alliance with the most powerful local kingdom that he had heard of, then coming back to the US and going where he knew he could find very capable African American leaders, historically black colleges. And then he recruited uh, several people to go back with him. Um, so because of his persistence, his efforts, that set the Southern Presbyterian denomination apart, that it, it had what became a racially integrated mission station where, where African Americans worked as professionals and received professional titles. And, and that it was doing so before many, many northern northern denominations did likewise. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to make a statement about the perseverance of Mariah, mm -hmm. Mariah Faring, because um, the Southern Presbyterian, she wanted to be a missionary. She had to learn how to read. Um, and went to uh, school with little first graders. She continued to push forward, and even when she, um, I guess, petitioned the Southern Church to be a missionary, they refused to support her. So she had to raise her own money. I think it was two years. She was on the field for two years under her own finances from selling her house. Yes, yeah. um, before the Southern Church agreed to support her. And I want to thank you for sharing so much about the perseverance of the missionaries. I wanted to also say that so many people persevere and it's not seen mm -hmm. and it doesn't go noticed because when the gentleman asked about people, um, current people, I thought about you, Dr. Angela. So a lot of times it's not something that somebody's waving a flag, but it's very much potent and powerful. Thank you. Uh, I will also I'll also add uh, my my thanks to to Dr. Sylvia and Jacobs, who uh, produced the first publications giving details about the life of Mariah Fearing. So she, she advised me in 2004 that, that I, should, I should start to learn more about her. And her life was so remarkable that I can never stop. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for offering us a perspective on Shepherd and on the Southern Presbyterian Church. I found it really interesting the way that you're connecting the the Congo reform uh, movement to loosening up the idea of the spirituality of the church and the, so that that's really intriguing to me. I'm I'm interested. William Shepherd seems to me a really complicated figure, and so I'm sort of interested in in the complications around that. I also am wondering what you if you subscribe to 
Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham's idea that the politics of respectability is very important for black leaders in the uh, in the early 20th century. And if if you would connect that at all to Lucy Gant Shepherd and to William Shepherd. Uh, thank, thank you for bringing up Dr. Higginbotham's work. Uh, her, her work is foundational for, for talking about female leaders in, in black churches in this time period. And I, I would agree that the public perception of the shepherds was shaped heavily by ideas of respectability and racial uplift in the early 20th century. I think also they had some influence on, on helping to define respectability for Black professionals at the time. When, when I started doing this type of research, I, I thought that if there are only a small number of African-American ministers who went abroad as missionaries, that they couldn't have been that influential. Or if they were on the other side of the world, they couldn't have been that influential. I was wrong on both counts because they continued to draw, draw attention for being people who were able to use their expertise, their degrees, their, their minds to live the life they wanted to live at a time when between Jim Crow segregation and lynching and other, other restrictions, it was becoming more and more difficult to find some sense of freedom. So missionaries like the, like the shepherds, they helped to represent dreams for many more people. And that dream became part of, of respectability, having, having some flexibility to de define yourself. Uh, the other part of respectability, having your own house. Lou, Lucy Kent Shepherd was very, very, very happy that they they got a brick house in, in Smoketown. Hello. Hello. My name is Beverly Hampton. Um, I'm the state president of Church Women United. And do any of you have you ever heard of it? Yes. <laughs> What church do you go to? I'm a CME. That's mm -hmm. now in Ohio. Okay. I used to be part of the Lexington. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, what I wanted to say about it is there is a, a really strong state community based program that is all about bringing together uh, interdenominational women. And here in the Louisville unit, one of my favorite things about it is, as a white woman, I, I have made many Black women friends through that group. And we do a lot to support community-based our needs and things like that. I'm thinking of, who knows about the Hope Bus? You know, I just want to say that Louisville is still alive with a lot of cooperation amongst the, the African American and, and white churches, and that the Presbyterian Church plays a big role in that. Thank so, you. I'm glad to hear it. Thank you. We have one question online, and then we'll get to Ellen. So uh, we have a comment and a question from Joe Davids. Uh, it says, thank you for your wonderful and informative paper. I loved it. I was just wondering if you had anything further to say about the name The Black Livingston. It's the title of one of William Shepard's biographies. The, and the, the title was given to him during his lifetime because of his fame as an explorer and because of the location where he was exploring that um, David Livingston had, had become famous for being one of the first Westerners to, to traverse Central Africa. William Henry Shepard was 
the African American explorer in the pith helmet and white suit, finding rivers that no one else had seen, entering African kingdoms no one else had had been allowed to enter, and coming out with respect from Africans and from American colleagues alike. So in the term Black Livingston relates to, to his exploring also as a, as a way to show how highly he was regarded in the late 19th century. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. It was fascinating. Um, I love learning about mission history and um, sometimes I try to teach a little bit about it through my work, but I heard you speak at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. I can't remember if it was last fall or the fall before, yeah. I think it last fall, um, online. And what stayed with me that was so fascinating was one of the things you spoke about was the silences in history. Um, you spoke about some of, you know, what I learned about William Shepard before you spoke last fall really highlighted that advocacy part and the pride of, you know, look at Presbyterians have been involved in advocacy. Mm -hmm. And that's and what you said helped me see that 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 also was true, but also um, didn't help me or other people maybe see other parts of his story unless you had to look really deeper. And we all choose what stories we want to to learn about and to dig deeper into. And I think that happens with current events, of course, as well. So I just was wondering what if you want to say anything about that in particular, but more generally as a historian, what um, you've learned and what you would want to impart to us as um, students and leaders and people about paying attention to those silences and history and current events. I'll talk about it in terms of my research process, uh, which still still ongoing. Uh, this story has taken me, ooh, I got to try to count back now. It, it's taken me about four years to, to get these ideas on paper instead of somewhere up here because of, of historical silences, because there's so much to, to find about William Shepard in particular and his early life in Congo, so little that specifically mentioned him here, here in this city. And my instincts kept telling me that there was a, a story that would connect it, but when I tried tried to just search for it, kept kept hitting brick walls, and that that silence, in hindsight, I can describe as as uh, as the effort to disconnect him from local Black history, and I couldn't reconnect him just by looking for information about the Presbyterian Colored Mission or information about John Little, or even just looking up his name. I had to, to set the name of, of William Shepard aside for a while and dive into what was considered irrelevant to this history, into what Smoketown meant to most of, most of the people who lived here. And then through that, I started to see, well, this is the world that the shepherds wanted to, to learn to, to fit into, that these are the, the things that matter to them that just weren't going to be mentioned in the history of, of Grace Hope Church because they didn't feed into that vaunted goal of promoting industrial education and recruiting local children to the, to the Presbyterian missions. Uh, but just because it wasn't an official part of, of the story didn't mean that the shepherd's efforts to place themselves in their black community were unimportant. That's yeah. Yeah, the lesson I, I keep learning to, to write and rewrite. The finding ways to, to bring multiple 
multiple historiographies, multiple perspectives together and see how they were they were together all along. Dr. Hill, my name is Melissa. I'm a student here. And as the administration and my colleagues in the classroom will tell you, I frequently ask a question that's before its time. Uh, but I want to thank you very much for coming here. Your, yours is a voice that I've been listening to from afar for a while now. And so I was really glad when you said yes. <laughs> and so this might not surprise you, ma'am, when I ask you, where is your mind going next? Because I'm already ready to just take that ride with you. <laughs> oh, we're going to have an adventure then. Uh, yes, I, I am studying the, the Black chapters of the YMCA and the YWCA. So that's that's how I got introduced to, to Mr. Albert Maisie. And I see this as a continuation of studying missionaries. There, there were many who wanted to go abroad like the shepherds did and just were not allowed to because of the fears of colonial governments or because their denominations were no longer willing to, to support African-Americans. So I'm going to look to identify more, more people who stayed in the U.S. and served local people while considering themselves missionaries, missionaries for the YMCA or YWCA, who sometimes did manage to, to also go abroad. Yeah, uh, the idea came to me while I was in the archives at Presbyterian Historical Society, which let me take a minute to mention, if you're interested in Historic photos, like the ones we saw in the presentation, most of those came from the Shepherd Collection in the Presbyterian Historical Society, a lot of which is digitized. So please, please go check it out. The, the Shepherd Photograph Collection, Presbyterian Historical Society, history.pcusa.org. Okay. One more question. Okay. One more question. Hang on. Been trying to formulate this way. Well, I'll just say what's on my mind and then I'll answer. What consonants would you say or experience that Shepherd felt for his ministry in the Congo and his ministry domestically? So the, you know, it's not like he was wearing a pit helmet and snow pants. Yes. <laughs> but that's the image I get. And that's not what he did. So what were the consonants, if you can understand what his ministry was in those two settings and how they connect? There was more connection to that image than you, than you might expect. So he was not walking around Smoketown in the pit helmet. But he did a lot to remind people that, that he still had one. <laughs> that, that his luggage was, was in the church, ready to take him somewhere else when, when needed. He, he knew that his reputation was his social capital. So a lot of the records that he left talking about his adventures uh, bringing, bringing in his status as the Black Livingston or things that he wrote after he got to Smoketown so that that's how he'd be introduced to people. Uh, for what he was looking like at the time, how he was feeling, I will use some comparison to the, the missionaries I studied for my book. I would, I'd say it's pretty likely Reverend Shepherd was unhappy with parts of his life in in the United States. Uh, I I would guess that he missed traveling. He it wasn't in his nature to focus on on children's ministry. He he had to do so because that's that's how the Presbyterian Colored Mission was organized. I think it left a gap 
between what he was doing and how he saw himself. I think he also likely had trouble watching, watching this community get more segregated after he got here than when he arrived. The, for the, the missionaries I wrote about in A Higher Mission, their, their home base was Selma, Alabama. And retiring to Selma after spending 30 years in Congo as respected professionals, and then coming back and seeing uh, various things that happened in, in Selma before Bloody Sunday, and it was it was heartrending for, for them. Let us give Dr. Kimberly the help. Thank you. So thank you. Uh, my name is Ann Monell. I'm the Vice President of Philanthropy and Stewardship here at the seminary. And thank you so very much. Uh, as a as a small token of our gratitude to all of you for coming today, there is going to be a, a small reception afterwards. And uh, Dr. Hill, I'm sure, will be available to if you won't take up all of her time, but she may answer a few more questions out during the reception. There is also information on how to purchase her book. Uh, so please, there's flyers out there, information, and so I encourage all of you all to do that. Um, I also just want to say, as a native Louisvillian, thank you for enlightening me, because it's making me realize how little I know about my own community. The only thing I knew about Mazik was that uh, there's a middle school downtown named for him. It's a uh, math, science, and technology magnet. Uh, Shepherd Square, I knew. Uh, didn't know anything about who he was, and that's a shame. Um, the other thing I just wanted to take a moment for a little bit of trivia is that Louisville Seminary has quite a history with Grace Hope. Um, according, if I was trying to count my records correctly, we have had four pastors there um, in its history. Uh, the, the longest serving one, I'm sorry, Terry uh, Davis, he was he's a Louisville grad. Of course, Angela is. We had an, another person who's Steve, starts with a C, um, but then also Dr. Grayson Tucker, and um, his daughter is here. And I just wanted to acknowledge that. So. But uh, thank you so very much. And then I'm going to get, let you do the honor. Thank you. We have a small gift, a uh, token of our appreciation. So thank you so much yeah. for this lecture and for enlightening all of us in so many ways. We appreciate How beautiful. it. I love it. So let us reset. Thank you, everyone, for so much for, for coming. We appreciate your attendance. And uh, so we hope to see you at future events. Thank you so much. <laughs>